Okay, we continue in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 4 through 14. But let's go through just about the 12th verse. That'll be, I think, as much as I'll cover out of that particular section. You shall not act like this toward the Lord your God, but you shall seek the Lord at the place which the Lord your God will choose from all your tribes to establish his name there for his dwelling, and there you shall come. There you shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the contribution of your hand, your votive offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. There also you and your household shall eat before the Lord your God, and rejoice in all your undertakings in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall not do at all what we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. For if you have not as yet come to the resting place and the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you, when you cross the Jordan to live in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies around you, so that you live in security, then it shall come about that the place in which the Lord your God will choose for his name to dwell, there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, and the contribution of your hand, and all your choice votive offerings, which you will vow to the Lord, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levite who is within your gates, since he has no portion or inheritance with you. We've entitled this The Matter of Worship. But what I'm also hoping is that as we go through the book of Deuteronomy, that we will not see this as a distant book with strange practices. Let's begin, for example, with the nature of the law. The law of God has three segments, the moral segment or the ethical segment. It has also the ceremonial or the religious, and it has the civil upon which the code for governing Israel was established. If you take a look at the moral code, the Ten Commandments, how much difference do you find as a Christian in the Ten Commandments as they were given to Israel and as we find them in the New Testament. I used to have a man come up and I don't know why I did it. I think I figured it out years later. Just out of the blue he'd say, we're not under law, we're under grace. Well, if we're not under law, if we're not under the legal law, is it all right to commit adultery? Is it all right to rob? Is it all right to murder? Is it all right to covet? Every one of these things are found as commands in the New Testament. Some have said that the only command of the, of the Ten Commandments not found in the New Testament is keeping the Sabbath. And some have argued the spirit of the Sabbath is there. But we'll sidestep the argument for tonight. The Civil Code, yes, you can see some things in the Civil Code that we don't see in the life of the church. But certainly, if we were indeed a theocracy, we would have to consider those. But many of those things, the spirit of the civil code is still with us as we care for the orphan and as we care for the widow. That was a part of the civil code. And when you take a look at the ceremonial law, you say, oh, pastor, things are so different. You had to kill all these rams and these bulls and all of these things? Yes, that's true. But the question is not whether there's anything similar in New Testament life. The question is, what was the purpose of those practices? And the purpose of those practices, say, for example, the burnt offering, 
It had to do with the confession of sin and desiring to have a right relationship with God and knowing what it would take to have a right relationship with God. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so I ask you, if we were to take the time to study all of the different sacrifices and the gifts, I think what you would find is, if I ask the question, how far apart are we? The answer comes back, not at all. And sometimes you hear people say, oh, that was then and this is now. That's the Old Testament people. This is the New Testament people. Historically, there is a difference. But the question is, how much similarities are there? And that is what has to do with the people of God. God has one people. You see the statement being developed in Genesis 3, and that line comes down all the way through till we see the people of God gathered together in the book of Revelation. And that's one of the things that I hope we see in this rather brief study of the book of Deuteronomy. But we started off this morning touching on this matter of worship. And is it not true that in our worship services, we at least consider that confession is important, that we, least, that we at least consider that the matter of thankfulness is predicated upon the significance of those offerings and what they imply. If Jesus said that the Old Testament scriptures taught of him, the question is, where do you see Jesus in the sacrifices? And there have been some pretty good books written over the years that Jesus Christ is indeed seen in the sacrifices. And the book of Hebrews argues clearly on that point. And joy. At least the thing that I keep in my mind as remembering, and I'm sure there had to be a balance somewhere, that if you were under the law, you were under a burden. Let me ask you this. How come there is so much sense of joy under such a burden? It becomes a burden when you try to make it a system of works. But when you see it as a system of God saying, this is how redemption takes place, there is where you find the joy of the Lord. And so tonight, we want to look at the second two. We want to look at the matter of dedication. And we look first at Deuteronomy 12.6. There you shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the contribution of your hand, your votive offerings, your freewill offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. In general, each one of these offerings will speak of dedication to the Lord. But the votive offering is the one that has a special significance the votive offering was offered usually, not always, but usually at a time of crisis. This is what we would call, say for example, the foxhole prayer. As the incoming fire and the artillery and the mortars are hitting all around the person in the foxhole, God save me from this and I'll serve you forever. And sometimes that story is told with tongue in cheek. But if somewhere along the line you hear stories that are actually the foxhole stories and the people kept their word, there was a voting offering. At least the spirit of the votive offering. It was offered at a time of crisis, and it was a personal binding or a personal commitment to God specified by way of promise. That it is within the covenantal system that in the broadest sense of the covenant there is promise, there is curse. There is benediction, there is malediction. But within that, there was indeed the promise. And a promise could be made. And this would speak of dedication. Dedication to God in times of crisis. How many times do we see people walking away from God in times of crisis? And is it not true that oftentimes the real point of dedication, anybody can be dedicated my dog is dedicated to me, especially if I give him treats. But if all of a sudden Alice gives him treats, he sure loves Alice. And sometimes that's the way it can be between people and God. 
as long as everything is going our way and we'll say, oh, God is doing this, that, and the other, but all of a sudden when that good hand seemingly is withdrawn and we're in the time of crisis and we're in the time of difficulty, then the point is, where is God? I guess I don't need him, and they walk away. But if there is indeed a, a true heart of dedication, dedication is in place even in the times of crisis. Now you may say, but pastor, is this promise not one that is negotiating with God? If it still comes from a sincere heart, uh, let me ask you the question, have you ever no negotiated with God? You don't have to raise your hand, but I know there's at least one person here who has. And when one takes a look, do we not see the challenge of the crisis? Do we not sometimes see that this crisis is indeed intended to demonstrate the strength, the quality of my faith in him? Jephthah made a vow, and he had to pay that vow, did he not? He asked if the Lord would bless him in war, that he would offer up his daughter as a sacrifice. And of course now, so many hundreds of years later, we're still arguing as to whether or not he put her up as a true sacrifice in the glorious sense of the word, which was a contrary to the law, or if indeed he set her aside in a life of perpetual celibacy. But that is at least one illustration that captures your attention. And notice the promise was expected to be kept. When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for it would be sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it of you. However, if you refrain from vowing, it would not be sin in you. You shall be careful to perform what goes out from your lips, just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised. Notice if a person makes a promise to God, God expects that promise to be made because it is an expression of one's heart and one's soul and the expression of one's heart and one's soul should be one that is satisfactorily accepted by the Lord. And notice here, the person is free not to make the promise. You're not a sinner if you don't. You're not a sinner if you do. You're a sinner if you do, and you don't keep your word. And that is it. Did Jesus not teach us? Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. In other words, let your word be as good as the vow. Let your word be as good as the promise. And we see that coming from the law. In fact, Jesus himself said this about the law. He did not come to abrogate the law. He came to fulfill it, those parts that had the demand on us. And so here we learn that in dedication to the Lord, this dedication requires integrity. And the voting offering, as it was being offered up, included the promise. And that promise required something from the promise giver and it was binding commitment to God. And God would accept that promise, and he would also expect the promised person to be the promise keeper. Notice that we are called to worship with devotion. Nothing new here. But in my view, this is something that we should look at regularly, particularly in our times. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and a holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Notice that we are called upon to worship God with a sense of devotion, not with a mechanical sense. Some people in our church have grown up in a high liturgy where you stand up and you sit down, you make the confession and this and that. And some people find it to end up being just nothing more than a sheer force of habit. 
I have always personally appreciated some of the readings of the confessions. For those confessions, we have one ourselves. But sometimes those confessions go all the way back to the apostles themselves, at least in seminal form, and they try to extend from generation to generation what we hold in common and what we hold to be of primary value. There are things in the scripture that are of primary importance and we must not turn away from them and we must get them right. There are other things that are of secondary importance and we hope to get them right, but we have not become apostates if we're not and we need to know the difference. And this is why, first of all, notice that our entire life should be the offering. Our entire life should be the burnt sacrifice. Our entire life should be the expression of the tithe and what it meant. The contribution of the hand, still there. The promises made, our promises to be kept. And the free will offerings. And while we may not do that particular thing, notice that this is the statement that I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, by his tender compassion, to present your bodies a living and a holy sacrifice. The death aspect has been cared for so that we can use our lives every day to be an offering of joy, thanksgiving, devotion, and love. So it isn't just going to church and coming to the altar. It's being in the temple of God as we live. And we become the sacrificial offering and we become the one who makes the offering. And the thoughts of our mind and the deeds that express those thoughts become the offerings. For notice that not only are we to make the entire life an offering, but it should be in response to the compassionate mercy of God, to God who has cared for the demands of the law that we could not meet. And notice that it should be something that is thoughtful. It should be that which is transforming. And do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Some of us grew up in a time, particularly in a time when worldliness was where you were and what you did, and it was usually a handful of things. If you didn't smoke and you don't chew and that kind of thing, you were pretty well home free. Now this is my sarcastic take on it. But I can recall so many times, you don't do this, you don't do that, you don't go there. And finally, one time I said to myself, I wonder what it is I'm supposed to do. And notice the term, the world, speaks of an attitude and a set of values. The world basically divine, defined by John is lust. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of biological. And we are to not be conformed to that set of values. We are to be transformed instead. And it should be a life that is a thoughtful life. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. This is one of the biggest jokes, I think, when we listen to the world of unbelief say, as soon as you become a Christian, you can put your brains on the shelf because you don't use them anymore. It's blind faith. I'll tell you what blind faith is, and I've shared it with you before. Blind faith is when you go around acting like there is a God and saying there isn't. Because everything that they have to say about how they understand this, that, and the other, A, they don't understand at all, and therefore, anything new could absolutely change things. Take some of the things that a poor preacher could know. Can you remember the time when science told us that we could no longer use paper shopping bags because we were going to tear all of the forests up and it would affect climate change? And so we all went to plastic bags and I muttered and 
did all of those things. And now all these years later, what are we going to do with all of these plastic bags? We're going to be inundated in them. Why, we already got plastic water bottles that can go all the way around the world just from America alone. I have it in the back of my mind that somewhere it was a scientific thing that came forth that said this is bad for our environment before we ever used the term. I remember when eating eggs were bad. They were bad for your cholesterol. And then later on they say it's okay. And then they used at least the concept that is somewhat biblically appropriate. Moderation in all things. God has given to us all things richly to enjoy. And the problem was in the failure of being moderate. And so I am supposed to say these guys, when they open their mouth, are speaking the truth. And in my lifetime, these are some of the things that have changed. I like paper bags. And therefore, I want my wife to go to Trader Joe because there's paper bags. Not because they're any better. They might even be a little worse. But it's for old time's sake. Let's be thoughtful. Let's renew our minds. And our Christian walk is not a walk of blind faith. Blind faith is, is when somebody comes up and says, the Spirit of God has told me such and such and so and so. About the time somebody tells you that the Spirit of God says you can have your wife on this side of town and your girlfriend on the other side of town, I'll tell you that it's the Spirit, but it's not the Spirit of God. And anything that we have is an idea, particularly when it deals with values, Let's be sure that we can square it away with the word of God. And our minds need to be transformed. We can relapse. And there must be this daily transformation. And it talks about being involved intellectually that go beyond the daily devotion. The daily devotion is a good thing to start. But you can't end there. And there must be some heavy-duty studying if there's going to be some heavy-duty transforming of life. And we have a singular purpose so that you may demonstrate what the will of God is. And it's not demonstrating necessarily shall I do A or B. It's to demonstrate that it is good. It's to demonstrate that it is acceptable. It is acceptable obviously to God and it's acceptable to the people of God. And above all else, it is perfect that it has a purpose in view and that purpose is good for us. We're called to worship with devotion, to make our entire life an offering, to do it in response to God's mercy, to make it thoughtfully life-changing. And I hope, at least in this particular company of people, for as many years as you've been Christians and as many years as you've been walking with the Lord, you should be able to sit down and take a look at what your life was like and what you understood in those early years of your Christian walk and what you understand now. And if the understanding isn't very different, you better wake up because there's not that much time left. And that's what needs to be said in the churches today. And we need to make it comprehensive as well. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord, rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. I like that term heartily because it's not an adverb at all. It's more of a prepositional phrase. From the depth of your soul, whatever you do, do your work from the very depth of your soul. That what comes out, comes out from the very core of our values as they have been worked over by regeneration. And it should include the entire activities of life. There's no such thing in the Christian walk as the sacred and the secular. Not in the Christian walk. The Christian walk is sacred and it must confront the secular and be confronted by the secular. 
and there is a difference. It should include the entire activities of our lives. You know this right well, but this is, the lights turned on for me years ago in reading 1 Corinthians 4. You know I've quoted it to you a lot, particularly the second verse. It's required of trustees that they be found faithful. And it's no big deal what anybody else thinks of us except the Lord. And then Paul goes on, don't go judging people. You leave that up to the Lord on judgment day. When on that day, the Lord will even judge the motives and the intentions of the heart. The lights turned on. I began to understand that the real important activity is not what is done with my mouth and with my hands. That only expresses what has been going on in my heart, at least for that moment. And so, notice that we do this for the Lord. And we do this with the full knowledge that from the Lord we will receive the reward of the inheritance. That which he has legally promised to us. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve and no other. And this is what we always need to keep in mind. That we are that holy nation and we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And his will becomes our constitution. And so we should serve him exclusively and solely, that it will be done in the full confidence that the Lord will respond. And lastly, from the dedication, notice the love. In Deuteronomy 12.6, there you shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the contribution of your hand, your votive offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. The free will offerings will express the continuous love as clearly as the other basic principles do. There's something about love that speaks of a proper response and the free response. Remember that rather sick bumper sticker that you could find on the back end of cars? If you love someone deeply or something deeply, turn it out, let it go. And if it loves you, it will come back. If it doesn't, go shoot it. Ah, I see, I see that you have seen that bumper sticker. Now that's warped love. Trust me, that's not love. But the free will offering is that one thing. And this is what I always really like to impress to people. Over the years, some people say, Pastor, you never ever really preach on giving as much as you should. That may be true. But this I have seen. I have seen people who are good with the language. And they can make people reach deeply into their pocketbooks largely because of what was said. I want my people to reach into the pocketbooks because they love Jesus. And I am not too sure how much it is that I should be pushing before there becomes some other sense of compulsion besides the compulsion of love. And this, I think, is the importance of seeing the free will offering. It's voluntary by its very nature. There shall you bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, which was a legal and binding thing, the contribution of your hand, your votive offerings, and your free will offerings. This is voluntary by nature. And it becomes the dynamic for the compliance with God's law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Notice they're not to be written away in a tablet. They're to be on your heart. And so Jeremiah speaks of the stony hearts of the people. 
But the promise is that through Messiah, their hearts will be turned into fleshly tablets and not tablets of stone. And that has happened in Jesus Christ. We see that clearly in the book of Hebrews. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. This is the foundation of our relationship, he says. And these words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. When you have the sovereign God, when you have the creator and the sustainer of the universe, you hear people say, look at him, he's given commands. Well, sure enough, he owns the place. If you're going to get in my car and you're going to do all kinds of silly things, I'm going to tell you to quit. I got the right to do that. I can give the command. I own the car. On the other hand, if you want to steal, oh, that's a different thing. And so what is at issue is the question, do I love God with the totality of my very being? Sometimes we can find a God and country love where it's some sense of equality. Sometimes we can find a devotion to a do denomination. God shares with no man the love that is due him. Everything else may have its place of loyalty and devotion, but it should never rise to a competitive level with the God who loves us with an everlasting love. It seems that as it was then, so it is now. Remember the teacher of the law came to Jesus and said, with the intent to tempt him, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. We are to love the Lord totally and completely. And we are to love the neighbor as oneself. And notice when the question is raised, Who is my neighbor? What person is not our neighbor? person who is in need, as we see in the parable of the Good Samaritan, everybody is our neighbor. Everybody who is in need is our neighbor, not just those who share the same values. If that weren't true, we wouldn't have missions. If that weren't true, we wouldn't have evangelism. And this love is in response to God's initial step. We love because he first loved us. And if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. The love that we have for God and the love that we have for the neighbor is in response to God's taking the initial step. We did not love him first. He has loved us. Our love for God is the only acceptable response. It's the response that includes loving the brothers and the sisters in the faith. And those who do not love are not of the faith. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Notice the term should. Sometimes it is defined as a mild command. But in this particular context, the idea seems to be if wherever one is generally, wherever one is indeed born again, then it should naturally follow that he is going to love his brothers and his sisters. And the one who cannot, the one who cannot do that, is not one of the family. Notice I said cannot, because 
we are talking about, we hear somebody say, well, he will not do that. Okay, a person will not, but why? Because he cannot? And Jesus oftentimes speaks of the fact that they do not do these things because they cannot. A spiritually dead person cannot do spiritually live things. You don't go to a cemetery to see live people pop up from just in front of the headstone. They do not respond because they have no physical life. And they do not respond spiritually because they have no spiritual life. God has spoken and dealt in love, and those who have been embraced by his love respond in the same way. How much different do we see that great command to love God with the totality of one's being and to love one's neighbor as himself? What is the difference that we see it read in the Old Testament and seeing it read in the New? And particularly when we see the application as it is given to us in 1 John. There has been a line of faithful witness and testimony from the time that Cain and Abel had their fight. Why? Because one offered the acceptable sacrifice of faith, which will, I think, entail love. Because faith and love oftentimes are pictured as heads and tails of the same coin. Let's be men and women who love God with the totality of our being, who are committed to be thoughtful people, deeply thoughtful people, that our lives will be continuously transformed until they are totally conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Have we not noticed those two important terms, conform and transform? We are not to be conformed to this world. We must transform our minds so that we will not be conformed to this world. But what will we be conformed to? We will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you for the solidarity of your word. We thank you for the oneness of your word. And we thank you for this as your testimony of faithfulness to us. May we respond in love, and may we show that response. In Christ's name we pray, amen.